let's begin with um, doing a, a meta practice tonight. And the one I, I want to do tonight is um, one that uh, I am very, very fond of. It's, uh, it's a loving kindness practice that was developed after 9-11 by someone at New York Insight. Um, and it's um, when it was first articulated, it had 11 or 12 iterations. So the first one was for um, the people in the towers and then their friends and families and then the first responders and their friends and families. And then it was um, about um, you know, sort of the people in the area there, and it just kept, you know, sort of, it kept getting bigger and bigger, uh, the leaders of the country, then more uh, leaders of the world. And at one point, at about 11 or 12, it was for the friends and families of those responsible for the attacks. And it was so moving to me that there was this reminder that the people who did this had people who loved them and cared for them and were grieving. Um, so it's, um, and this is the uh, loving kindness practice that I usually use at the correctional facility because it's um, a little more um, pragmatic. It's uh, a little more general. It's, um, it just seems that it, it really resonates with the, the offenders. So we'll do that for um, about uh, 10 minutes. And um, just again, let the, let the words just resonate. It's also interesting. When I uh, perform weddings, I use this one. And you know, for the, the, the two people who are getting married, for their friends and families, and, um, and it's, you know, it's kind of a hit in the prison. It's a hit at weddings. It's, it's a, a great meta practice. So um, I hope you'll enjoy it. May we be well, safe, and peaceful. May we be well, safe, and peaceful. May we be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May we be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May we find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May we find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May we cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May 
May we, <coughs> may we cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May we live in peace and harmony with all beings. May we live with peace and harmony for all beings. May we be well, safe, and peaceful. May we be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May we find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May we cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May we live in peace and harmony with all beings. May our families and friends be well, safe, peaceful. May our families and friends be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May our families and friends find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. May our families and friends cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May our families and friends live in peace and harmony with all beings. May all persons everywhere be well, safe, peaceful. May all persons everywhere be free from the suffering caused by fear, anger, and ill will. May all persons everywhere find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another.
May all persons everywhere cultivate loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. May all persons everywhere live in peace and harmony with all beings. I hope you enjoyed that, uh, Meta. I think you know uh, the um, the phrase about finding forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. It's both forgiving and being forgiven. And um, you know, we don't hear a lot about um, forgiveness in um, in the insight tradition. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh does talks about forgiveness a lot more. But actually, in uh, as I understand it from a piece I read quite a few years ago, that, um, that forgiveness in the Theravadan tradition is the complete absence of ill will. That it doesn't mean that you have to reconcile with a person or engage with a person, that once you've abandoned um, all um, wishes for that individual to be harmed or to suffer in any way, that that, um, that essentially is, um, is forgiveness. And I've always thought that was, uh, you know, um, that was a bar that was low enough that I can really imagine myself working with it. Um, because it, it it doesn't require that that sort of um, reconciliation, and there may be times where it is, you know, not at all safe to um, to engage with another person. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about this a, a little bit later when I um, read something that, that Larry Yang wrote. But but I do think it's um, the recognition that it is inevitable that we harm one another through our, um, mostly through our, our ignorance and that uh, you know, we, we would like to um, be forgiven and to, to forgive. And I think it really is something that especially with the offenders is, is really meaningful to uh, them. So Meta, <coughs> excuse me, uh, usually translated as loving kindness, is is really this feeling of friendliness, um, benevolence. The the early texts talk about it as uh, not having ill will, and it's just a wish for the welfare of all, including oneself. So it, it's a you know a sort of lovely, um, benevolent kind of feeling of wishing all beings um, well, 
And it was initially, as I think many of you know, it was taught as an antidote to fear. And if the story is that there were monks doing a rains retreat and the Buddha told them to go into this forest and um, they were sure that there were tree spirits and all kinds of spirits in the forest that really didn't want them there. And so they left and they came back and they asked the Buddha for uh, a reassignment. And he taught them this practice and sent it back. And he said, if you are completely without harm for others, they would have no reason to fear you and no reason to harm you. So it's really this idea that when we are completely harmless, we don't give others reasons to, to fear us, which of course is not to say, there's no guarantee that we will, will not be harmed, but it's, um, it's um, a wonderful, um, it's wonderful to think when you're engaging with someone that this person has nothing to fear for me. I'm not, I, I will not harm this person. And I used to, uh, years ago when I worked, um, I worked on the, the AIDS line, people would often call me, be really, really angry about something that was going wrong in the system. And they'd be just furious. And, um, and it was not something that I could fix, but I, I often thought, you know, I am such a safe person to be angry with because there are just no constant, you know, I can't, I won't retaliate. I wish you well. I understand that you, you know, that, that this, this, the systems are just awful. And I would just feel really good knowing that this person could vent completely. And I was a, a safe person to, uh, to vent with. And, um, you know, that's really helped me in, in a lot of ways, very, even a little more personal many, many years ago when my son was in high school and every, everyone got along with his teachers, his friends, and he would just get so angry with me, like angry beyond belief with me. And um, I went to see a counselor about this with him. And the counselor said, so you're the only person he gets really angry with. And I said, that's right. And he said, so I guess you're the safe person in his life. And you know, that just changed everything. And I have passed this on to um, numerous other moms and dads who have had, um, you know, who just feel so terrible because their kids are just totally um, acting out toward them. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's a sign of safety that you are not, you are not going to harm them. It's really safe for them to um, express this anger. And I think that's what meta is, you know, that we can sort of hold um, what's going on with this sense that life is um, extremely difficult. And, um, and people really um, need care and, um, and compassion. So having this sort of benevolent attitude of wishing people well you know, often I see that that little meme about, you know, be kind to everyone. You don't know what sort of battles they're engaged in today. And I think that's also part of this heart of, of meta, of realizing that we're all struggling. And so being, being kind, wishing people well, um, having this kind of um, default setting of benevolence and, and friendliness um, and just accepting it. Yeah, things are difficult for, um, for us all. And that I think is, is a very, um, is really a, a helpful uh, default setting. And when it's, um, when we teach it in the, in the Theravadan tradition, it's usually taught as, you know, starting with oneself and then a benefactor, um, friends, family, a, a, you know, neutral stranger and then onto someone more difficult. And it's the idea that um, these feelings should not be coerced. They should develop very, very naturally. And, you know, since we're a, a caring species, you know, we're, we're, we're primed to care about each other. 
um, you know, metta can arise really naturally. So we begin with uh, those who are, uh, sometimes it's more challenging for people to begin with themselves and they might think of themselves at a time in the past when they could really have used support and, and just send these good wishes to that small person who was really adrift. Um, and then you can send it to someone who just really inspires you. And it doesn't have to be someone you know. I mean, I, I do know people who, uh, the Dalai Lama is their benefactor or Jane Goodall, um, someone who just sort of um, inspires them with that, that sense of um, a life uh, well of who exhibits that kind of kindness and care uh, so that we you know, work with the benefactor and then we could move out to family or, or friends if it seems natural. And often when people are doing very intensive uh, meta retreats, Sharon Salzberg talks about, you know, working with the benefactor for a month, that all she did was work with the same person for a month. And she said she imagined that person in different period costumes and she just really tried to keep it, keep it lively, but it's to really have a sense of that person's goodness. So we have a sense of our own goodness, our own goodness for having this aspiration of benevolence, <clears throat> benevolence and um, friendliness. And then we recognize it in another, another being. And sometimes I know people will use, um, you know, a, a pet or a child, and you just might want to, you know, adapt your, whatever your metaphrases are. So may you be happy, may you be healthy, you know, if you're, um, may you live with ease, if it's your, your pet. Um, so, you know, whatever, whatever really um, cultivates that, that feeling of, of friendliness and warmth. And then when you've done, you know, friends and family or whoever, if you are, um, if you're feeling that, that sense of wishing for others what you wish for yourself, you can try working with um, the familiar stranger or the neutral person. So that someone you see, but you don't really know. So it might be your postal carrier, um, when we went to gyms, it was someone you know you might see at the gym to check in with, or a cashier, or um, you know if you see someone regularly on a corner with a sign, you know you can just call that person's um, image to mind, and then just recognize that that individual wants for themselves, you know, to be safe, to be protected, to live in peace, and just offer it. Um, Kamala often talks about, you know, metta is just this beautiful offering of, uh, of good wishes. Uh, it's, it's so this act of um, just um, friendliness. It is, it is a very friendly um, gesture. And then ultimately, um, we can work with someone that we might have um, difficulties um, with. And I'm going to talk about that in in a little bit moving, moving to that. Um, with loving, loving kindness, sometimes people talk about a near enemy, something that looks like loving kindness, but isn't just kind of masquerading. And it's usually attachment or expectation that we want something out of our, our offering, that we have an agenda in offering. Um, you know, may you be safe and protected. May you clean up your act. May you file your tax. You know, I mean, we can just kind of um, go on and on with that agenda. And, and part of the offering is it's just this freely given wish for um, a person's um, contentment, happiness. Um, and when, when Metta encounters suffering, then it becomes compassion. So what characterizes loving kindness generally is just kind of a wish of wishing well that other people had for themselves what we would wish for ourselves, to be safe, protected, live in peace. Um, 
and it's um, it's focusing on the goodness, the goodness in our lives, the goodness in um, in uh, in other people's lives. Now, may may we live with equanimity? May we have appreciative joy? Um, so when we meet someone who's suffering, our wish becomes um, for that suffering to, we recognize the suffering and we wish for that suffering to be alleviated, a wish for their liberation from suffering. Um, and so it's, um, it's not just uh, empathy about the suffering. It's also in it is, is a wish to, um, a wish to have the suffering alleviated. And that might just mean the person learning how to make peace with things as they are. But it's that, um, it's that move toward, um, toward the good. Um, so, uh, so that's just something to, to note. And, and um, mudita, appreciative joy, <laughs> is when we recognize you know, uh, the good fortune of another and we're happy for that person's good fortune. Um, so we can really cultivate this quality <clears throat> to care for the welfare of all. Um, and a lot of times when people are doing metta, they realize that they have this care for the natural world. You know, there's this sort of kinship um, with the earth in a way. Um, and, and they offer this um, aspiration for the ecosystem in a way. You know. Uh, for, for all living things to be well, for all living things to be sustained. Um, it's kind of an unconditional regard for the welfare for others. Um, you know, it's, um, some people have said, well, you know, it's not, it's impossible for all beings to live in harmony because beings have to eat each other. And that's true, but that still doesn't prevent prevent us from, from having this aspiration, wishing that beings would live with some ease. And um, you know, in this pandemic, this has been a time, I think, when uh, you know, we can really cultivate this aspiration for all persons to be, um, to be healthy, for all persons to be protected. Um, and this probably brings us to more about sort of the difficult person because there's been a lot of anger, for example, about people who are not wearing, wearing masks. And, um, you know, can you find it in, in your heart just to wish that person, may you be safe and protected without um, being angry that that person is choosing not to protect themselves or protect you. And if you can't, you know, you can um, come back to yourself and offer metta to yourself about really recognizing how important it is for you to be safe and protected. And you just hold that, okay, so I really want to be safe and protected. And that's a perfectly um, ordinary, um, creaturely kind of, uh, Kind of wish. So it, you know, the, the the issue with meta, and this is often a little um, tricky in a way, is not to make it feel feel forced. So we can always come back if we're not feeling benevolent. We can come back to our intention to develop that capacity, um, rather than you know gritting our teeth and saying. May you be safe and protected um, when that's not really where our heart is. But come back to the to sort of the, the fundamentals. And I've got this wonderful um, little aspiration by uh, Larry Yang, who seems to capture this uh, completely. I'll, and I'll read it twice. He says, may I be as loving in this moment as possible if I cannot be loving in this moment, 
May I be kind. If I cannot be kind, may I be non judgmental. If I cannot be non judgmental, may I not cause harm. And if I cannot not cause harm, may I cause the least amount of harm possible. I'll read that again. May I be as loving in this moment as possible. If I cannot be loving in this moment, may I be kind. If I cannot be kind, may I be non judgmental. If I cannot be non judgmental, may I not cause harm. And if I cannot not cause harm, may I cause the least amount of harm possible. Now, this seems to me really doable. It's, and it, it really is sort of at that basis of having a good intention, an intention of, um, of non-harming. And if you can't be loving, can you be kind? If you can't be kind, can you be non-judgmental? If you can't be non-judgmental, can you avoid harming? And if harm is inevitable, may it be the least amount of harm possible. You know, and as we, as we see other beings, and these are sort of the difficult beings in our lives, either the difficult beings that we know personally or the difficult beings in public life, you know, we, we can see them as being shaped by causes and conditions. We can see them as this, you know, a product of many, um, this whole constellation of causes and conditions that have come about. And, um, and we can see, um, them as afflicted with defilements. When we see cruelty, we can recognize that as an affliction of the mind that comes about because of causes and conditions. It's not that we condone it, but we can recognize that this is something that, that was caused. Um, recently, I read a very long article in the um, Atlantic about um, collaborators with dictators throughout history and with and with really terrible regimes and they said you know it's really hard to to know who is going to be the person who resists and who's the person who's going to uh, collaborate and Hannah Arendt wrote about this a long time ago and she said sort of the, the way to um, protect yourself against that is to always recognize within yourself that you have the possibility to be a collaborator, that you have, a, that it is possible for you to do the evil about which you are now opposed. And that it was really by keeping that, um, that alive. And, and the, the book, uh, this, this article concluded with someone said, you know, it's about having this, um, resolution to be a decent person all the time. The importance of being decent about the little things as well as the big things. And I don't know if that's much of a, a conclusion. Um, I, I, I said, I don't know if that's, that's um, it's not exactly uplifting, but it's not um, a totally depressing um, 
conclusion, but it, it seems that this sort of attention, and that's really where mindfulness um, fits into, into metta too, about really being aware of our, our intentions, um, seeing very, very clearly um, what's going on in, in the mind as we're offering metta too. Is there, is there this sort of agenda? Um, is it something that um, is, um, is without substance? So I mean, it, it's, it's a, as we've been talking about all these sorts of things, it really is a, um, a practice. And it seems to me that it's, it's a, a kind of culmination of a lot of the things that we've been talking about because it involves discernment and, um, and wisdom. And it's about seeing things clearly and, and still having that, um, that open heart, that heart that doesn't close down, that heart that, that is able to, um, to see that um, all beings want to be safe and happy, although the, um, the ways in which they attempt to realize that are often really, really distorted. But you can still wish for people to be happy in the most fundamental and wholesome, wholesome kind of state. So um, it's a, uh, a wonderful, um, you know, sort of default state to wake up in the morning with a mind of friendliness, a mind of benevolence. Um, and Kamala Masters talks about, you know, that as a kind of training to, um, to really cultivate that aspiration to, to have that as, um, as your kind of basic setting, this kind of just friendliness, or you might even say abandonment of ill will. Just, um, you know, years ago, I'm trying to remember this, I hope I can get this. So there used to be, um, you know, what was the, the bumper sticker about, oh, um, no good act goes unpunished was one bumper sticker. And another bumper sticker is, you know, no act of kindness is ever wasted. And, you know, there may not be empirical evidence for one or the other, but you will be a much happier being if you have that sense of no, no act of kindness is ever wasted rather than you know, no good deed goes unpunished, now having that sort of cynical view. But saying you know, no act of kindness is ever wasted. You never know when the seeds of your um, your goodness are going to bring forth something. So we never know. So I really um, encourage you to, uh, to practice with this. And um, you know, we can always reflect on our intention to cultivate it. Um, Ruth King has a bracelet that she gives out that says, mindful of race, not there yet. And you know, I, I think about that kind of mindful of metta, you know, not there yet, but this intention to uh, to really work with that to be more a part of our, um, you know, our kind of default setting. So I'd be really interested in your comments or questions or thoughts about working with this. And just un unmute yourself and jump in. Yeah, um, Patrice, <laughs> see you. Um, I was really interested to hear you talk about how sometimes um, meta can be a little bit tricky if you have an agenda. Um, I did have that experience with myself when I was trying to do meta for myself a few months back, and I was really having a hard time emotionally, um, and and I was trying to do meta for myself, and I. And I was sort of having this sense of like, I was like, you know, be well and, and feel better. It was like I was, was trying to make myself feel better. Um, and luckily I kind of recognized that it, did, it didn't feel quite right. 
Um, and then I switched to doing meta for other people. Um, so I definitely experienced something like that. And, and you can have, you know, um, you can feel a kind of tenderness for that part of you that wants to fix. You know, one, one of the most, uh, sometimes I think about this, um, Ajahn Amaro once said, you know, the mind is like a committee and it's got a rotating chair and every so often, you know, the four-year-old gets the chair. And, um, you know, and we can think about, you know, parts of ourselves and sometimes, or, uh, you know, if we have a critical voice. So Sharon Salzberg says she calls her critical voice Lucy. Um, Dan Harris calls his Robert Johnson. And when you're critical, you know, you're, you're sort of fix yourself voice. You can just give that part of yourself a name and feel some tenderness for that part's good intentions to make things right. So you, you don't have to um, push that part away, but the other um, sort of wiser parts of yourself can just hold that, uh, that conditioning, that critical conditioning with a kind of, um, of tenderness and affection and benevolence and um, just realize that it's a condition, this is conditioned thoughts and uh, sort of let it play itself out. Um, so we don't have to kind of scold ourselves for that, that sort of um, the fix it part of, of ourselves, but just again, bring that tenderness. Oh yeah, this is my conditioning and, and feel that sort of kindness. Um, thank you, Patrice, yeah. Um, I pulled out my Parami book, but I, I don't remember if it was Ajahn Suchito or somebody. One of my teachers defined it also as the absence of ill will, if that's as far as, you know, that's mm -hmm. okay. And um, when I was having a very, I've always had a hard time with Meta right from the get-go in the beginning. And um, especially with the self, and then, um, and I used to say, someone told me, but I think it came to me, uh, to be honest, to put myself in the difficult person category. And it, and it really opened up a lot. Uh, just to be, just the honesty of that, because there was something in my heart that was dishonest and trying to force the mind or heart a certain way. And then when I had a really traumatic experience with a, a Dharma teacher uh, several years ago, um, someone told me in a difficult relationship or when there's been harm like that, not to force the heart to send Metta to how the person you label as the perpetrator in that moment, but to send Metta to the situation. Ah. And that was, I've, I've been working with that for a couple of years. I um, wanted to share, it's been so helpful. So when there was a breach with a family member um, and it's just really raw, I'll send Meta to the relationship. And it's not a hope that it'll be repaired. It's not any, it's, it's just a radical acceptance of a, a tenderness of holding this relation. There's suffering here. You know, may it be, you know, may it be healed, maybe be okay, whatever the outcome on the ground. Um, and Meta to the fact, the radical acceptance when something really a horrible betrayal or a terrible loss the situation or what we're, some of what we're experiencing in the world today. Mm -hmm. Can I send Manta to the way things are? And it just, I don't know, it gave me a little bit of space to hold things that I initially feel are intolerable, you know, that there's something there. So I was wondering what your thoughts, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, that that's really um, beautiful. I uh, often listen to a, a Dharma teacher who teaches in England um, Zohar Lavi, and she has a, um, a talk called Metta to Phenomena, Phenomena, and it's about offering, offering um, Metta to, um, you know, like the, um, the, the sort of, um, right now that, you know, this huge encampment in, in Palermo, and the difficulties of the situation, the difficulties for everybody involved and just having a lot of, of tenderness toward that and caring. And I think that that caring part, which is not so much, you know, in the Theravada, they talk about some absence of ill will, but, you know, I, 
it, it seems to me that it, it is that, that caring part that recognizes impermanence, that recognizes conditionality, this very um, mature part um, of us can have this kind of caring for extremely difficult um, situations. And next week when we talk about um, equanimity, it would be sort of meta infused with equanimity about sort of an impartiality um, about that. The other thing about having oneself as the difficult person, you know, one of the strategies in offering metta to a difficult person is to see if there's anything that um, you know that's good about this person. And you know, usually when we, when we do it, we start with someone who's just mildly annoying rather than the most difficult person uh, in our lives. But, you know, I used to, uh, years ago, I had a, uh, I was with an organization, there was a board member, and we just seemed to butt heads every time we were in a meeting. And I just felt that he was, uh, just made my life, um, miserable is too strong a word, but I always left meetings feeling really um, misseen or wh whatever. And so when I started doing meta for him, I just kept thinking, he is a great dad. I, as a board member, he was really difficult for me, but he was a great dad. He loved his kids. And I would just really reflect on what a great dad he was. And, and that, you know, when I thought about that, I thought, so, okay, so he's, he's really a difficult board member, but, you know, it was really important that he was um, a great dad. So if when you're offering metta for yourself, if you are your own difficult person, you can think of it, is there a quality about yourself that you really appreciate? And, you know, it might be this quality of a kind of ruthless honesty, but that, you know, it's that quality that is trying to do good. So you can work with, um, with that. And my kind of ultimate um, fallback with people who are just extremely difficult, and these are mostly you know, public figures, um, I just imagine them on their deathbed. I think we're all going to die. And this person may be really frightened at the time of death. And um, because I've been with people who've been dying, it's, it's very painful to be with someone who is really frightened at the end. Um, and you know, in the, the Buddhist literature, there are all these stories of people who, you know, lived um, very, you know, not good lives, and and the end is really a struggle for them. They don't die peacefully. So I reflect on on that, and that sort of softens my heart um, toward that individual. So when we're trying to work with metta in this way, it really, you know, you can use a lot of imagination between, you know, Sharon talking about, you know, dressing her friend up in different period costumes to offer metta for an extended period of time, to thinking about the good qualities of a person, um, maybe to think that um, this person probably had a very unhappy childhood, or um, I knew someone who was, was very, very difficult, and I thought, and this person's taking care of a child who is um, severely compromised, needs tremendous care, um, you, know, you know, so this person was really, really a hard person to be around, but you know, I thought about that. This person cares for this severely um, disabled child. So, you know, if we, if we can use our imagination um, you know, we can find that in our, uh, we can open our hearts into not wanting them to suffer, okay, so, so sort of abandoning ill will, which is not that we don't want justice, but we don't want them to suffer for the sake of, of suffering. And for people who have had, you know, who are the victims of sexual assault or something else, that may be so far down the road that, you know, that's a very distant possibility that, that working with Metta is really just working about themselves and compassion for themselves. And uh, it's not re-traumatizing people saying, and by the way, you know, we want you to get to the point where 
you're willing to, um, you know, let go of these feelings toward your perpetrator. I mean, that would that would be cruel. That would be a misuse of the teachings to try to set someone up to do that. But it can be an aspiration. Sometimes teachers say, yeah, it's an aspiration. If not in this lifetime, maybe in the next lifetime. Um, so, you know, we work with this um, in ways that make sense um, for us. And it's really uh, an ongoing, ongoing exploration. Other thoughts? Hi, I'd like to hear more discussion on um, tenderness and softness. I, I think it's something I often forget. So we might, um, you know, again, we can, we can say, so what, what makes us feel um, kind of um, warm? And, and this is, I know, Ajahn uh, Suchito, who says, you know, something, oh, I think of kittens. <laughs> Which is just really kind of surprising that for, I don't know what I expect a monk to say, but, um, but you know, we, we can think of things that where we felt some sort of tenderness in the past um, or in present, and we just kind of support that, you know, and we see, so what are the conditions that bring around our, our feeling of um, caring? And it's that, um, I think it, it it's more when we feel a tenderness towards something. For me, there's often um, an implicit notion that I will do what I can to protect this. I mean, it's, it's not kind of, you know, may all beings be happy, but you know, when I'm say in, in a really beautiful place and I think, and if I have an opportunity to protect this or to do something to support this, I will do this. It's just that kind of undertone um, feeling and that we often have, you know, when we, we meet someone and we just have the sense, so if there's something I could do to help, help this person, I would do that. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be anything dramatic, but it's, it's um, a kind of engagement um, in the welfare of another if that were possible is that is, that, is this making sense to people to, to say it in, in a sort of way i haven't really articulated this um before but it is it is um when i think about a kind of tenderness towards something i do think of it as um protective maybe safe and protective and that i would do what i could to um support that um, that protectedness and and safety. So I think that's what I mean by um, by tenderness. Does that make sense to you? It did at first, but then as you continued it kind of put me in my head and you know and um, I, I'm trying to understand and figure out how to like open more to my body and you know um, with kindness, you know, with compassion. And, and when you started to talk, I thought about Michelle McDonald. Mm -hmm. She would use um, an image, and I don't know if it was specifically about loving kindness. It might have been about like um, a mom calf or a mom cow protecting her calf, or I mean, mm -hmm. just a, um, yeah, like a, a, imagining a, a tender scene. Mm -hmm. And I'm such a, you know, as a social worker, I, I'm like, my go-to is, you know, what can I do to make it better? Mm -hmm. And so that puts me in a whole nother place than opening to tenderness for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think it, it's, um, especially when we think about sort of feeling tenderness toward our bodies and I, if we've had a, you know, more, and, and I've certainly, you know, been in my head most of my life. And, um, you know, it's, it's more of a challenge to, um, to work with it. So I think it's just kind of a long-term 
hmm. aspiration. And it may be by thinking about how, um, how some bodies are kind to other bodies. You know, I mean, like watching a whole lot of little YouTubes of um, puppies playing or the pandas or, you know, uh, like dog and a horse playing today and yesterday a colt playing with a, a big ball and, you know, watching things that just kind of evoke that and, and just notice how that feels in your own body would be one way possibly of, of working, working with that. Um, so Thank you. I hope that, I hope that helped. Yes. So we are, are just about um, out of time and next week is our, our last week and we'll be talking about um, equanimity. So um, I hope that will be interesting to you and I really appreciate um, your participation this evening. So thank you all very much and have a good week.